Bonjour and welcome to the third podcast of the Network for Strategic Analysis. Our topic this time, Canada and the new power struggle in the Arctic. My guest and expert today, Magali Vullierme, postdoc at the North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network at Trent University, and Whitney Lackenbauer, who is Canada Research Chair for the Study of the Canadian North and Professor also at Trent University. Welcome to both of you. Icebreaking question. As Canadians, should we fear Russian and Chinese intention in the Arctic? Well, thanks, Jean-Frédéric. It's, it's an interesting question, and I think it's, it's really one that I, have to, I think we have to place in the context of how we feel about China and Russia more generally in terms of the resurgence of great power competition globally and where the Arctic fits within it. So the way I often conceptualize this question is thinking about threats through the Arctic, threats to the Arctic, and threats in the Arctic. So when I think about Russia and some of the new technologies and tactics that they've demonstrated in recent years, Russia's great power competition with the United States means it's definitely a threat through the Arctic in terms of some of their delivery systems and a threat to some extent to the North American Arctic when we think about where the United States has some of their military capabilities based in Alaska. But when it comes to a threat in the Canadian Arctic or to the Canadian Arctic, I just don't see it. So I think from a Canadian standpoint, we see Russia as a great power global or international threat, but not one that's particular to the North American Arctic. In contrast, I see China not as much as a threat to the North American Arctic, as much as a power with growing interests in the region whose activities may represent a threat in the Arctic in the future but not related to its military capabilities as much as its investment in science, which could have strategic applications, its investment in strategic resources and getting a foothold in particular areas of the Arctic, which would allow it to project its power. So when we think about China as an emerging Arctic player, I see it less as a short-term threat to the region or through the region as a big question mark globally about how we're going to deal with the rise of China more generally and what aspects of the risks that China may pose to Canadian interests and values that may have Arctic dimensions to them. And the big challenge then is actually defining what we consider to be an Arctic threat versus mm -hmm. what we can see, conceive of as more general threats posed by these two potential, potential rivals. So it's definitely not a clear and present danger. It's more a diffuse, maybe building threat we must monitor. Absolutely, and, and the importance of being very clear in terms of our own strategic estimates about where we see those threats and what domains we see them coming and how we deal with new emerging tactics that do not play by the usual conventional rules of how defense threats are usually applied. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this in certain parts of the circumpolar arc. Uh, so speaking of monitoring, uh, Magali, how, how uh, should we be monitoring the activities carried out by Russia, such as building infrastructure and, and China that is increasing its presence in, in the Arctic? No, I think it's important to monitor uh, Russian uh, infrastructures, not because of fear of military uh, activities, but because of how it will show how the climate change will impact the region. For example, uh, climate change is a huge impact for Russia at sea because it will open the Northern Sea route, and so it will open uh, the, the route to more ships. And this is why Russia is currently upgrading its bases along the coast. So um, not building new ones, but upgrading them. And it's really important because it's an obligation with international treaties to be able to conduct search and rescue operation in its border. So this is why Russia is uh, really upgrading its infrastructure. On land, it's also really important because climate change will have an impact on uh, Arctic infrastructures, uh, more specifically permafrost thaw. There are 70% uh, of Arctic infrastructures and 60% of Arctic communities that are built on permafrost. And this is a huge threat for every Arctic country. To take, for example, uh, the US, permafrost thaw has uh, been uh, named as a threat in the US uh, Department of Defense Arctic Strategies of June 2019 as a threat to its bases in Alaska. 
Uh, so, so far there are nine US bases in, uh, in Alaska and six of them are uh, built on permafrost uh, zone. So this is a huge uh, impact that we have to monitor uh, in, in the future. Regarding China, I think that the COVID-19 crisis has put a big hold on uh, the Chinese Arctic uh, impact since there is a huge economic crisis and China footprint in the Arctic is above all economic. And then there is also a huge impact on the energy sector and uh, China is uh, partners with Russia in uh, the energy sector. Last but not least, there is also uh, quite uh, uncertainty about the availability and the secure of uh, the Northern Sea Route in regards with uh, building in uh, shipping. And so this is why uh, we will have to monitor uh, closely how China will respond after the COVID-19 crisis and how it will impact uh, its uh, Arctic strategy. Mm -hmm. A quick follow-up question on this. Um, so this is a good overview of what we should be monitoring, but in a nutshell, uh, do we have an indication or do you have an opinion on how we should be monitoring that? Well, through scientific research, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, regarding climate change and uh, permafrost thaw. Uh, there are uh, lots of research that are going yet, uh, uh, no results yet, because uh, permafrost thaw is um, a really not well known uh, phenomenon so far. So, if you take climate change, yes, you need to, to have a, a look at the scientific research. Now, how are Canadians allies reacting to all these developments? Because it sometimes seems as though Ottawa is basically alone within NATO, for instance, when it comes to its position on, on Arctic security. So thanks for the question. I, I think there's sometimes some misconceptions around uh, differences within our various alliances. First of all, we sometimes talk about the Arctic as if it's just a single space. Mm -hmm. But geography still matters. And certainly for Canada's allies in, say, the Nordic area, uh, with Russia as one of their closest neighbors, they face a, a different military threat environment than Canada does in our particular part of this broader Arctic region. So over the last decade, we've seen more of a focus of some of our Nordic allies, like Norway, in wanting to see NATO, for example, our North Atlantic Treaty Organization, take a very explicit role that the Arctic is part of their security concern. For a long time, Canada was quite concerned on a couple of fronts. First of all, we didn't really want some of those NATO members who weren't Arctic states to be meddling in North American Arctic security. We like to deal with that with the United States bilaterally, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the US through NORAD, which I'll mention in just a moment. Secondly, Canadians were concerned that we would unnecessarily provoke Russia because Russia has this deep-seated concern that NATO is circling around it and that the Arctic is another area where the world could be amassing as a hostile set of conquerors of Russian territory. So for a long time, Canada was quite reserved in wanting to have NATO speak directly about its Arctic security role. We've now changed that since 2017, our defense policy does see a role for NATO in the Arctic, still a measured responsible one. Um, but I think we still largely see that as something that NATO is something that Canada contributes to away, to defeat threats away from Canada before they can actually threaten us here. Um, so we do have quite good alignment. Bigger question is the United States. All of a sudden the United States has been waking up in the last year or two to Arctic defense and security. It's started to put a lot of rhetorical emphasis on the region and threats that might pass through the Arctic and strike at the US homeland, whether it's China or Russia, as we've referred to before, as key pieces. So big questions are now about where the Arctic fits in the US's role as a global superpower. And for Canada, the question is whether or not our traditional relationships within the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, are going to hold, and as the US decides to invest more emphasis on deterrence in the Arctic, what role Canada is comfortable playing? And this is a very dynamic area with lots of uh, technological questions and, and lots of really fascinating debates that I think are gonna, are gonna come and emerge in Canadian circles in the next year or two that we should be prepared for and really strike at the core of what our relationship is going to be in the 21st century world vis-a-vis -vis our American partners 
with our longstanding alliance with these neighbors and then a changing world order more generally. Mm -hmm. That's actually a nice segue to my next question because more specifically, um, the Trump administration has challenged Canada's position in the Northwest Passage uh, specifically. And just as a reminder for our viewers, um, even though the Americans have always maintained that it's in an international strait, and Canada argued for its part that it's uh, internal waters, both countries agreed to disagree in some respect on a temporary solution, solution that had worked quite well so far. But Mike Pompeo brushed aside all this by reclaiming the U.S.'s right to sail through the passage without asking for permission. Should it be considered even though it comes from um, uh, our closest ally, uh, a bigger threat than Russia, for instance? Well, if I have to answer by a yes or no, I, I would say yes, because when it comes to the Northwest Passage status, Russians are the best allies to Canadians because they are applying the same mm -hmm. approach to the Northern Sea Route than the Canada. And uh, Pompeo's declaration can can be a potential threat to uh, this uh, Northwest Passage status. However, there are no action has been taken so far by the US, and um, they have a huge uh, lack of capacity so far. So, um, for example, they, they, they only have two icebreakers that is mm -hmm. uh, operated by the Coast Guard, and one is uh, refueling the Antarctic research bases, and the other one is operating during summer in Alaska for search and rescue operation and to, uh, to help Arctic research uh, mission as well. And, and just um, for our information, uh, how many icebreakers does Canada have? You have a much larger fleet than the Americans do. Okay. okay. <laughs> and they also need Canadian Coast Guard to, to help them to refuel their bases in Greenland because they have uh, the Thule bases in northeast uh, Greenland. Northwest Greenland, sorry. A conflict, an open conflict with Canada will not help the US to help uh, to, to counter uh, Russia and Chinese position within the Arctic. So it's a bit unlikely that they, there is going to be an open conflict about that. And I really think that Canada should have a closer, um, a closer monitoring of the new US uh, strategy within the Arctic because. The U.S. is really enhancing its presence in Arctic and within Arctic states. So not in Alaska, but uh, in other Arctic states. And for example, they open a permanent um, diplomatic mission in Nuuk in Greenland in 2020, in June 2020. Mm -hmm. And this has, caused, uh, this has put a lot of stress and pressure on uh, the Kingdom of Denmark. And it's not, it's not that well viewed by Denmark. And it creates a bit of uncertainty. For the future. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, Donald Trump wanted the U.S. to buy Greenland at some yeah, point. See that, yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was a huge buzz uh, last summer, but uh, <laughs> I can but imagine. Yes, they are here, yeah. <laughs> but they didn't follow. They, they they never followed through on that. Never. No, of course not. Greenland yeah. is not for sale. You know, it's Greenland. They they have you know Inuit in there. It's you know part of uh, the kingdom of Denmark. So, but but they they have announcing their presence and this opening of the, the new consulate is a sign of this mm -hmm. and they also um, help um, the Greenland with the COVID-19 um, crisis they give money to Greenland and so this is not yeah the Denmark kingdom of Denmark has to find its new position with this announcing presence of uh, the U.S. And it's, yeah, it puts a lot of pressure on them and uh, they want to create a really united front mm -hmm. within uh, the kingdoms of Denmark, uh, Faroe Island and Greenland. And uh, there is currently a diplomatic uh, trip that is uh, ongoing with the new attaché for Arctic uh, region, uh, the US attaché. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's uh, conducting a, a trip uh, in Nordic countries and he's visiting three uh, towns in Greenland. So it really show how important Greenland is for the US. This information being now uh, a powerful tool uh, in the great powers toolbox, um, has the Arctic been an object and, and, and Canada a target uh, of disinformation from uh, Russia, China, or any other power? I mean, that's a tough 
question to answer in the sense that if we have been a target, some of the people who would know how we've been a target and where we've been a target would probably be keeping that information pretty sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to speculate that in the future, the Arctic may be a vector which adversaries may use as they're using uh, misinformation and disinformation campaigns in other parts of the world to strike at certain Canadian vulnerabilities. Uh, I would respectfully disagree with Meg Ali to see the United States as a threat more than Russia or China. They're our closest friend, they're our ally, they're a neighbor with whom we have had a very stable agreement to disagree over the status of the waters. And I think that despite uh, Secretary of State Pompeo's comments last year, we did not see a US freedom of navigation voyage because as Meg Ali said, it would not be in the United States' interest to get Canadians riled up and seeing the U.S. as a threat and potentially undermining our alliance. Now, speaking to your question of disinformation, I could see adversaries of Canada wanting to strike at our relationship with allies like the United States or some of our European allies to try and use the Arctic or some Arctic debates or disagreements as a way to drive a wedge in our relationships. I don't see it this primarily because Russia or China would be looking for Arctic conquest, not to take over our territories or take over our resources. They would probably be doing this because these relationships that we have in the Arctic are related to our presence within the world. And mm -hmm. I could see the Arctic being used by adversaries as what I often call a diversionary theater, a place where if they can draw our attention away or undermine our relationships in the Arctic, it may give them more marge de manoeuvre, like a more maneuvering space elsewhere in the world to achieve desired strategic ends. I could also see adversaries using disinformation and misinformation campaigns within Canada domestically to drive a wedge between Canadians. Last uh, fall, right at this time, Canada released its Arctic and Northern Policy Framework, which was co-developed by our federal government and many different rights holders and stakeholders throughout the North. It also had a caveat that said that it wasn't a single policy representing everybody because the governments and different representatives couldn't reach a consensus on every issue. So there are existing divisions over what forms economic development should take, how many resources the federal government should be investing in the region to deal with persistent health or other socioeconomic indicators that are lagging way behind the rest of Canada. Given the nature of these debates within Canada, there may be opportunities that adversaries would want to use to create political friction, to undermine Canadian social cohesion, or to try to increase the amount of political polarization within Canada. Again, not, part, not particularly because the adversaries would be striking at the Canadian Arctic, mm -hmm. but using potentially the Canadian Arctic as a way to just divide Canadians, undermine our clarity and coherence of vision, and challenge what we, what we think we should be expressing collectively in terms of our national interests, not only within the circumpolar world, but internationally. And the weaker that we are as a country, potentially the less likely we are to, to go and work in a concerted way to achieve our, our goals around the world. Well, very clear, very insightful uh, elements from, from both of you. Uh, lots of trends and, and spots to, to monitor, to help us monitor what's, what's going on in this, uh, unfortunately, often overlooked region, even though it's huge uh, in Canada. So Whitney, Magali, thank you very much. Great, thank you.